Okay, so we're going to get started. If anyone's late, they're just going to have to watch the video. Okay, so we're first going to start off with, um, no, it's Holy Trout. Like, um, well, I guess I can see that. No, it's for Mike Trout. Baseball, of course. <laughs> Bass Pro Shop stats. That would be funny, though. Okay, so we're going to start off by going over the project a little, because I know some of you have had um, some questions for the write-up portion for the project. So we'll go over that. And then uh, we're going to continue our for loops lecture. We're going to do our example that we have with this data that I just talked about. Oh, and I forgot to change something on the canvas. Initially, I was going to have a short quiz on Wednesday, but we actually don't have class this Wednesday because of Veterans Day. So we're going to have, I'll send out an email. I'm not sure if I'll do a quiz on next Monday or next Wednesday. Okay, so if you go to Canvas and if you go on this week, then you're going to see that we have a holy tryout data. So you're going to download that. We're going to go over an exercise for that today. And I also added an example report for the uh, for the project that you guys have. So we'll talk about this in just a second. Okay, so first thing though is going over some of the um, some of the stuff for the project. Uh, so your project it's due this Wednesday, so don't forget it's due by eleven fifty nine p.m. Uh, make sure that you include stuff uh, up to November 6th. So that data is up on Canvas. It's been up for a while now. So make sure that you're using data for November 6th in the report. Okay, I don't think I, I, yeah, I didn't add anything here. Yeah, okay. So what I put on Canvas is an example report. So you can click on that. I can't preview it in my browser. So I'm going to open this up, but you can download this example report right there. And I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so this is the an example report that I made for you guys. You don't have to follow this exact formatting, but it's uh, for your reference. Okay, so we have our title, uh, obviously put your name. Okay, and then we have our intro. So let's actually go back here. Okay, so on the handout that I gave you guys, we have a section here called report structure so this part does have to be the same i want to see that you have an introduction first then you have your results and deliverables then you have your appendix which is going to have your list of figures and then your actual full code um so there are some questions on whether you're going to include all of the figures in the report uh yeah so you're going to have every single figure in the report so I'll kind of show you what that looks like too. I think it made my room too cold. I left my window open and I'm like freezing right now. Okay, so here's the example report. So we have our intro. You're going to have your super great rad intro. And then we're going to have our results. So uh, here we're going to have a few write-ups. I think we have five in total. So again, you don't have to do exactly what I'm doing here, but this is how I would have kind of gone about it. I would have first said that here we're going to have some code breakdowns and we're going to have um, all of our graphs. So we're first, before we can actually post process the data. Okay, so before we can actually post process the data, we have to clear our MATLAB memory and then we have to import all of the relevant data for COVID-19. Um, Okay, so we're going to do that, and then we have um, basically actually showing how we're going to import the data, and then I kind of break down the code right here. So I say that our ring table function, that's going to import our CSV files as a MATLAB table, 
and that's going to allow us to store different data types in one place. Okay, and then I also break down why we have uh, preserved variable names. And then I mentioned why we have the string function here to convert uh, country names from a character array into a string. <clears throat> okay, and then, and then I say that now we're ready to actually post-process the data. And this is a note to all of you. So, um, you know, I didn't show all of the uh, code for importing all of the spreadsheets. You would obviously have to show that in your report. Okay, there's a few questions. Let me actually pull them up on my main computer. <clears throat> okay, so one question, would it be acceptable to display cumulative cases and deaths on the same graphs? Um, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, so, so yeah, Ryan is saying, can we have cumulative cases and deaths on the same graphs, i.e. bar graphs with dual bars and plots with two y-axes? Um, yeah, you can do that if that's how you want to go about it. Okay, what if we already submitted the report without the full code included, but the uh, submitted the separate M file? Uh, so you can submit your report again, because I do want to see the full code at the very end as well. So you're gonna have the full code at the very end of the report and you're also going to submit a separate um, .m file so I can actually run your code myself. Okay. Okay, let's keep going through this a little bit. So now that we got uh, we have this kind of code here to talk about how we're actually going to import the data, then we can start showing the graphs that we have. Okay, so here I'm gonna show every single graph that we have for the report. And uh, one of the first things we have to do is a code breakdown for global cases. So I, I don't show everything here again, so that's why I have this note to you guys here. But um, I talked about the first thing that I would have done to make this graph. So the first thing is doing the testing range, and then the next is getting the the last day for testing, and then we have um, a line of code for finding all of the indices for uh, testing. All of the indices for each country for the last day of testing, I should say. So I break this down line by line. Again, uh, it doesn't have to exactly be like this. Do it however you want to do it, but you need to break down everything that's in your code. Okay, and then we have our other figures here. So this is where you do another breakdown. Here's another breakdown. All right, another note to you guys, there's a lot of code here for, um, for this log graph and this rectilinear graph, a lot of the code is basically the exact same. The only thing that's different is using your semi-log function and some of the formatting for like your, your axes. So in that case, you don't have to repeat all the code if you don't want to. Uh, you can just mention the code that's the same. And I have an example for that that's actually on the handout. So you can check that out. It's, uh, let's actually go to that really quick. Oh, it's up here. Okay, so right here, um, I'm, you know, doing our y-axis formatting here, and I did the x-axis formatting up here. So the first two lines in this code here are very similar to the first two lines of our code here. So I just said it follows a similar explanation. You can rewrite it if you want, but it's up to you. Okay. Okay, so that's all of the figures, and then we're in the appendix now. So this is a list of figures. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have ever actually put a list of figures in your report. Sometimes they're at the beginning of the document, um, but I'm having you put them at the end inside of the appendix here. 
Okay, so again, the format doesn't have to be exactly like I have it, but for me personally, I broke it up by subsection. I Ideally, I would have also put the subsection title here, but I didn't uh, have enough time to keep messing around with it inside of uh, LaTeX, so... This is how I have it. We have the figure number here on the left, then we have the actual figure caption, and then we have the page number that that figure is on. So in LaTeX, you can do this kind of, you know, automated. I only have to use one command, and I think Word should have something similar to build a list of figures for you. So you don't have to do it manually. Okay, there's a question. Are we submitting a .m file as well as the report? Yeah, you're going to submit that separately. That's uh, laid out. Once you actually go to submit your report, it shows that. Okay, so that's everything for the uh, example report. Um, if you go to the report to submit it, So we got to go to assignments. So if you go to submit the report, you need to turn it, you need to turn your report in as a PDF. It should be one PDF, and you should upload your script file as a .m file. So you're just gonna you should have an option to submit your report here, and you can submit both the PDF and the .m file. Okay, so are there any other questions on the report before we get started on the lecture? Would you change the, there's a thing that says allowed attempts, one. Can you do, change, can we, oh. can you change that to like more than one? So just in case if some soon as some accidentally submit the wrong thing, they can yeah, still I'll submit do it. That right now. Okay. Say so you have unlimited amounts of attempts if you mess something up on one of your submissions until the actual due date. Okay, any other questions? Okay, do I want the code for all figures in the report or just the five selected graphs? I want all of your code. So put all of the code at the very end and then you're going to submit all of your code in your .m file. Yeah, that's a big thing. I want to actually look through all of your code to make sure that you obviously have everything. You just didn't get a figure from someone else. And then I want you to submit your code so I can actually run it myself and make sure that it works. Uh, uh, professor, when you said the appendix for the, for the graphs, does the appendix show is that for the code or is that for the report that we did up, up top or the list of figures? I don't know what you mean by is it for the code. Okay, so like you know how in the code like we label what specific section we're doing like is the appendix uh, for that or no. do we need to make a separate document with the pictures of the graph and then... So the appendix, this is all you're doing in here for the appendix is your list of figures, and then you'd also put in your code in a different section, all of the code. So this part here, this list of figures, list of figures means it's referencing all of the figures that you have in the report here. So if we look at like 2.1.1, that's referencing that figure 2.1.1. This is the caption for that figure, and then this is the page that it's on. So it's on page two. So if I go to page two, and it's right here. This is figure 2.1.1. The caption, this is shown in the appendix and we're on page two. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and do we also have to write a, a little bit of the discourse for each graph or no? Do you have to write what? Like a little bit of discourse, like you have for, code, for the code breakdown of 2.11. Like would we have to do that as well for each graph or no? Are you saying this part in the middle? Yeah, because you know how in two point one one you have the you have the the picture of the bar graph and then you have so you have ex, you have stuff on the bottom explaining the graph. Do we have to do that for every graph too, or just? No, that's just for the selected uh, write ups that I have you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, for the write ups, you had five of them you have to use. So this was one, of them. and then oh, okay. another. This is another, and then you had two more later on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, anything else? Okay, if there's nothing else, then we're going to get started. All right, so I already mentioned it, but not everyone was in the on the uh, the call yet. So uh, this Wednesday we don't have class, so make sure you don't show up then. It's uh, Veterans Day. Let's have one more question. Yeah. When we're saving our our um our graphs or not our graphs our, our figures, um, do we when we go to the, the export setup area, like do we have to save each one or just the only five the five? You need to save each figure. Your okay. in the report you you need to show each figure. So I I even showed that in the example uh, okay. report. Okay, so I'm going to go over where we left off last time. I didn't finish talking about the uh, entire example. Oh, that's weird. It looked like it was really delayed on my other computer. Hold on. Okay, so I don't think I finished talking about uh, or going over this last example last class. So we're going to go through this first and then we'll go through a few more things and then we're going to actually do um, like a big example. So hopefully we can finish that today. Okay, I'm making you script. Oh, I can't move this now. Okay, it's uh it's the ninth though. Okay, so we'll do clear, so you'll see, and then we'll actually start working on our example. So it's where we left off last time, so you can open up your script from before if you want, or you can just make a new one. So I'll just do example three, because that's what it was from last time. So the first thing we're going to do is make uh, just one factor. So we have x equals um, 0 to 2 um, to 50. And what we're going to do is um, use a for loop to calculate the square root for all values that are less than or equal to 25 and calculate the cube for all values greater than 25. So we actually built this up last time, but we didn't go through all of the explanation. So we're going to do for i equals 1 to the length of x. So we're doing uh, 1 to the length of x so we can go through each value in our vector x. And we have if x of i is less than or equal to 25, we're going to calculate the square root of that value. So I'll say n sub i. We're doing n sub i so I can go through each value in x. So n sub i equals square root of x. Square root of x of i, I should say, because we need to, again, go through each value in, um, in x. And then we're going to say else, so if this condition isn't satisfied, if x of i is not less than or equal to 25, we're going to calculate the cube, so m sub i minus the length of n, we'll talk about that in a second, equals x of i cubed. Okay, and then we're going to use two n statements so we can um, end our if statement, and then we can end our for statement. 
or a for loop really. Okay, so if we run this code, let's move this over a bit. Okay, so if I run our code and then we go in the command window, we can type in n. And then you see that we have nine columns. So it's um that calculated the square root for values that were less than or equal to 25. And then if I type in m, then now we have 10 columns, and this is going to correspond to all of the other values where we calculate where we calculate the cube of x. Okay, so our breakdown here, uh, we're going from for i equals 1 to the length of x, so that's so we can go through each value in our vector x, as we mentioned. Okay, and then we're going to calculate uh, for all the other values, we're going to calculate the cube for um, everything else that wasn't satisfied for being less than or equal to 25. So why didn't we put m sub i minus the length of n? So if we first go to n, we see that that has a length of 13. We have 13 values here. I think I said nine columns before. Yeah, it's 13 columns. Yeah, and 13 columns here. Okay. So first off, our length of x, that's 26. We have 26 values here. So for our, our for loop here, um, the total length that we should have, so if we do n plus m, if we look at both of the lengths, that should be 26 as well. So the length um, of n, that was 13, and then the length of m, that's also 13. So we have 26 values in total. Okay, so we can kind of, um, or first off, why did I do m sub i minus the length of n? So um, n, that was a length of 13, so if I instead did m sub i, let's do that first, and then we run our code, it still runs, but if I go to m, we see that this is a length of 26 now. So the first um, 13 values here, they're 0, um, and that's because uh, at this part, we're not actually computing anything for the first 13 values because we computed... Uh, something for the first 13 values for our variable n. But, uh, you know, these are kind of useless for us because we didn't actually want to have anything here for, for m because we don't actually start uh, calculating anything until the 14th value. So to address that, I'm just going to do m sub i minus the length of n. And this will, even without doing any any hard coding, so without actually expressing which value to um, to start on, or which index to start on, we can just say m sub i minus the length of n. And that's going to just automatically make our length 13. Okay, and then we can actually check that our code is working correctly, even though we know it is, but we can make sure that it's working as expected just by taking out our our kind of math expressions here. So let's just do x of i there, and then we have x of i down here. Okay, so what we should have, if we run this, we have if x of i is less than or equal to 25, then we're going to have our output be n. So we should see n, that should go from, from 0 to 24. So we start at 0, and then we go over and it goes to 24. So that's good. And then we need to have all of our values for m. That should be uh, 26 to 50. So if we go over here, it starts at 26 and then we go over to, to 50. So that works as well. And again, if we just had m sub i, then it would start out with zero. It's for the first 13 uh, columns here. But again, that's, um, you know, it's useless to us because m sub i should only start on this uh, 14th value. Okay, so that's why we put in m sub i minus the length of n. Okay, so we're good with that. Okay, so now we're actually going to go on to plotting with for loops. So 
again, I kind of want to go somewhat fast so we can get to our example at the end because I think that'll be the most helpful. Um, this is another good one right here. So plotting with for loops. So we can actually use for loops to plot multiple things at once. So for this, I can use just one line of code to plot all three of these functions at once. So before we do that, we're going to use our usual method that we've done before, which was um, which was using the function hold on. So before we would actually have all of our functions here, we would basically plot them one by one. So we'll first do that. I'm going to do this somewhat quick again. So I'll call this plotting example. Okay, so we're going to have our x domain be u equals 0, step size is 0 0.01, and we're going to go to 10. Make that a section. So you'll see in you know, a lot of these examples that I do, I have uh, comments for just about every line of code or for every section that we do. So hopefully your report was structured like that too, where you have a lot of comments. I won't write you down for that if you don't, but putting in comments is very helpful to you and someone else that's reading your code so they can kind of understand what you're doing. But again, if you didn't do that, I won't mark you down on that. I just want to make sure that your code actually runs. Okay, functions to plot. So the first function we'll do, we'll call it f1. That's going to be cosine of u times 2 times e e to the negative 0 0.5 times u. f2, that'll be cosine of u times 3 times e to the negative 0 0.3 times u. F3, this is negative 2 times cosine of u times e to the negative 0 0.3 times u. Okay, so we have all three of our functions. And now we're going to do our usual plotting method. Okay. So we're going to do plot u, so that's our x domain, and then comma f1, that's our first function, and we'll make the line width 2, and then we, before we have to use hold on, so we can plot our other two functions, so we'll do plot u comma f2, and then line width of 2, and then we can do our last function here, so plot u comma f3 with a line width of 2. And then we'll do hold off because we're done plotting our functions. And then I'll put in our legend here, which will be f1. Uh, so for the first function, then f2, and then f3. All right, if we run our code, then we get our, our nice plot here. And so that works, right? That's, that's fine. But we can also use a for loop to plot all of these functions at once. So if you can imagine if we had a lot of stuff that we wanted to plot at once, it would be, let's say we had like 50 things we wanted to plot in like a bar chart or something. It'd be a lot more useful and we could use a loop if we had to use, um, if we either had to use a loop or to actually plot everything one by one. So for the project, we didn't have to use any looping. I think about the, uh, the states graph, right? That was a bar chart with, um, with like all, you know, 50 states. I think we also had New York City. But we had a lot of bar charts that we were, or a lot of bars that we were plotting in. In that case, we actually didn't have to use um, a loop or go one by one because that was in its own array. But in this case, here what we plotted that wasn't in its own array. So let's do the same thing here, but we're going to use um, a for loop to plot our functions. So make a comment, and then we'll say that this is our new looping method to plot. 
Okay, so I'm going to say func for function. And we're going to put all of this into a table. So we'll do table f1. And I'm going to transpose these. So they're going to be, instead of a row vector like they are right now, you see it's 1 by 1001. We're going to make them a column vector so we can put that in a table. So I have f1, come f2, and then f3. Are we supposed to leave the prime, like f1 prime, f2 prime? Yeah, that's to uh, transpose it. OK. Yes, yeah, so we're doing that uh, because once we make our table, um, you'll see. Actually, I'll just run our code right now. Did I not put a comma? OK. Let's comment this out. So if I go to our table now, so we have uh, three columns here. If I had it in rows, um, it wouldn't work for our table because we need to have them in columns where we have our variable names up top here. So we can't have a uh, row variable names for the table. At least I don't think we can. Okay, and then I'm gonna do func. Actually, was that already there? No, right now our variable names are just var1, var2, var3. So I'm going to rename those variable names by doing func dot properties dot variable names equals and then we have to do f1 comma f2 comma f3. If you had a a really big uh, table, you wouldn't have to do this if if your variable names weren't um there automatically, then you just have to use um, array addressing like we've done before. But this is just for convenience. So once we look at our table, I can uh, see each of these variable names and I know I'm looking at F1, F2, and F3. Okay, so now we're going to actually use a for loop here. First, I wanna see, this is, uh, this might work too actually, let's see. Yeah, this works. So, okay, this worked right now, even without a for loop. So occasionally, if we um, if we don't have everything in the table like we do now, I would have had to use a for loop. Uh, but here, I actually didn't use a for loop, and it still worked as as expected. So this is what we did on the project for a lot of our stuff. Um, because I had all of this in one table, so in our our table func. Once I said plot u, and then comma table to array, which I'll talk about in a second too, and a func, that actually plotted all of the curves. So what this is doing, it's actually using an implicit uh, for loop that we talked about last class. So even though I didn't explicitly say to, um, to plot everything, it did plot everything because it's using an implicit for loop. Okay, but if we didn't have all of this in one table, um, we could uh, we could have used a for loop as well. Um, but let's use a for loop, an explicit for loop, and we can still make this plot. So we'll do for i equals one to the width of func, and we're gonna have our plot here. And then we're gonna put um, line width comma two, and then we have n, so I need to delete one parenthesis here. So we would have actually had to do, my slides are somewhat wrong here, we should have had to use um, array addressing, because really this is still plotting this uh, using an implicit for loop here. So we would have had to use array addressing, so we would have to do, let's see, all of the rows, and then uh, columns one to three, or we could do i, because we have i equals one to the width of func. If I go to the command window and I do width of func, why are you, uh, get, oh, yeah, there we go. Then we see three. So I'm using this um, function width, because if we have a table, I either need to put height or width. So if I type in height of func, That'll give us the amount of rows that we have. Okay, so back here, 
if I uh, if I do this now, now it's actually going to use our looping method, and it's giving me an error still. Oh, okay. I think I, I'm missing a parenthesis here. Okay, yeah. Nope, that only applied to one. Okay, we can use it. I know I'm kind of stumbling here again, but we can use for looping here. Um, an explicit for loop. So I don't see it right now, but we can actually uh, iterate through um, all three columns that we have. So here, yeah, um, in, in our slides here, this was still an implicit uh, for loop here. But we can do it explicitly. Um, I can't see the, the issue right now, but we can do it explicitly. We would basically have to go through um, each column that we have here. Trying to think about this again. No, that won't work either. We can do all the rows. Let's try this instead. Okay, yeah, that works. This is um not doing it uh, where I'm iterating through i, but this is still a method that we can use, which is really still implicit looping. But we can use explicit looping. Um, and I think we're doing that in our example today, once we go over our data uh, for Mac trail. So we'll go over that then. Okay, let's see, there's, um, oh yeah, also I used table to array to make this plot. Um, because if I just left it as our table, then there should be an error. So we have to do table to array. And this is also in our, in our example today. So I'll show that then. So we have to use do table to array to actually convert everything into a into a number. In this case, it already was a number, so this actually might have worked. But once we do our, our example, I'll show you that uh, th that kind of issue. Okay. So one thing that we do this is actually I wanted to add on to this, and I spelled initializing wrong. Um, we can actually initialize our arrays uh, to save memory. So. I forgot to add stuff to this slide. I wanted to, but we can still go over this right now. So we, we often initialize an array. Actually, I can show this. Um, uh, yeah, I'll show this example for here. So let's first work on this example. We're going to have nested for loops and we're going to build this matrix A by using nested for loops. Okay, so we're going to type out this code here. Oh yeah, I actually do initialize my array here. So this is a good example. So we'll do nested for loops example. So I'm not going to initialize the array yet, and then I'll show you why we initialize the array. So first off, I'll do for i equals one to four. And in this case, i is gonna stand for our rows. So we have four rows here. So I'm gonna do i equals one to four. Then on our new line, I'm going to do for j equals 1 to 4. So for j equals 1 to 4, that'll correspond to our columns. So we also have four columns. And then you don't need to worry about this um, code too much. I'm just, this code is just to make this array here. So I'll do if j is equal to 1. So if our column is equal to 1, then we're going to put a 2. You'll see that on the next line. And then we're going to do or, this is a uh, short circuit or, or i equals to 1. So if we're on the first row, then we're also going to have a 2. Or i equals 4. So now we're on the fourth row, and we're going to have a 2. Or j equals to 4. So in the fourth column, we're going to have a 2. So I'll do a sub i comma j equals 2. And then else a sub i comma j equals one. And then we're going to end our if statement. We're going to end our first or a second for loop and then end our first for loop. So if I run this right now, it's going to make our matrix here. So you see that right here in the bottom. 
Let's uh, comment this out. Okay, so we have our matrix A on the bottom here. So our for loop worked. But as I go up here, so I'm going up to our very first line here. We have A equals 2. So this is building our matrix kind of element by element. And that's fine, it works, but it's going to take up memory. So if I hover over A, my message keeps disappearing, but it says that the variable A is changing every size through the loop. So I don't know why it's not staying, but our variable A is changing its size through each loop, because as you saw here, we start out as A equals 2, and then it iterates, and then it has A equals 2 and 2. Yeah, I'll get to your, your question in just a second, Amro. So we're building our size here for each pass. So because of that, our code is kind of inefficient. So what we can do, we can actually specify the, the size of our array that we're making beforehand. So I'll do a equals zeros of uh, 4 comma 4. And once I do that, you'll see that the red squiggly lines there, they went away. Actually, I'll leave that like that for now. Now, if I run the code and I go up top, you see that our array, it's already built up for the size that we're going to have. So because of that, we're saving memory, and this is going to run our code faster. Okay, so that's good practice to do to uh, initialize, it's called, to initialize our arrays if we're going to build an array using a for loop. Okay, any questions on that before I get to Armour's question? Okay. Okay, so Armour, what's happening in lines 49 and 51? So 49... Oh, yeah, okay. So on line 49, I have A sub I comma J equals 2, so... A sub i comma j, we have a sub i, that's going to correspond to the row, so the ith row, and then j means the jth row. So same thing down here. So on line 49, if these conditions were met, so if we're on the first row, or sorry, the first column, the first row, the uh, fourth row, and then the fourth column, then we're going to put a 2. If we're not on this uh, any of these rows or columns, then we're going to have a 1. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Just checking the time. Okay, so I think this is the last thing before our exercise. So I think last time Ryan had a question if we could make multi-dimensional arrays with a for loop and... <clears throat> Yes, we can. So we'll do this right now. Okay, so we're going to use nested for loops once again, but instead of making a matrix like we did up here, we're going to make a multi-dimensional array. Okay, so let's do this. So we're going to initialize our array once again so we can save memory. I'll call this multi-dimensional array. Example, so I'm going to do B equals zeros. We're going to have four rows, four columns, and then we're going to have comma three because we have three of these arrays that we're going to make. Because I'm going to do four I equals, let me suppress this up here. Okay, so we have four I equals one to four because we want to have four rows once again. Uh, equals 1 to 4, and then for j equals 1 to 4, because we want to have 4 columns, and then I'm going to do 4k equals 1 to 3. You can uh, use any variable that you want, so you don't have to use i, you don't have to use j, and you don't have to use k. Now, typically, personally, for me, I use i to represent the row, and j to represent the column, and k is kind of arbitrary. I don't make multi-dimensional arrays too often. Okay, so now we're going to do if i equals to 1, so if we're on the first row, we're, and if k, 
So if we're on the first matrix, if k equals to 1, then we're going to make a matrix b sub i comma j comma k is equal to 2. Else if, so if our row is equal to 3, we're going to do b sub i comma j comma k is equal to 1. And then we have else. So if none of these above conditions were met, we're going to have b sub i comma j comma k equals just a zero. So to do that, I'm going to put zeros, or you can just put a zero as well. That should work. Okay, so we're going to terminate our if statement. We're going to terminate our third for loop. Then we're going to terminate our second for loop. Then we're going to terminate our first for loop. <clears throat> So I'm still like really cold right now. I did a tape wrong. Missing an eye at the first. Or missing a, a, a whatever, a line, right? What am I missing? I'm blind here. Oh, I equals to one. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, so if I run that, then this will work. So I'll, I'll go over this, uh, our actual code here in a, in a second. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I didn't see that. Okay, so we'll look at B. So here we have our multi-dimensional array. We have our first matrix, our second matrix, and our third matrix. So I'm not going to go over this code in too much depth here, because again, I just want to focus on actual the, the for loops here. But you can look through this yourself and you can kind of double check these conditions. So we have if i is equal to 1 and k equals 1. So if we're on the first row and we're on the first matrix, then we should have a value of 2. And we see that right here. We have a value of 2 on the first row and the first matrix. Then I have another condition here, if i is equal to 3, so for in the third row, for any matrix, we're going to have a value of 1, and we see that as well. Else, so if our conditions above, if they weren't met, we're going to have a 0, and we see that throughout. Of course, we already had our array initialized to be 0, so let's put a 5. And then you see that all of the other rows change to a 5 or all the other uh, values change, change to a 5. OK, any questions on that before we start our exercise? Professor, quick question. I don't know if this just depends on, on the version of MATLAB or not, but for me, I was having, when I had just AND, it didn't let me run it. But when I put double AND, it let me run it. Is that, okay. a, is that, is that like a pro, or is that like a version thing, or is it just? It might be. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If you have two ands, that's a, a short circuit and. So that's, um, short circuit means that we have to first satisfy the first value for our statement. So that would mean that we have to first satisfy if our row is equal to 1. I actually have a little red squiggly here. Oh, yeah. So if it says if we put two ands, then we're going to have better performance, actually. Okay, so now we're going to go on our exercise. Hopefully we have enough time. I'm not too sure, though. So I think this will, hopefully, since we're doing something practical here, it'll help you understand uh, for looping a bit better. Okay, I'm going to make a new script. So again, if you didn't download the data from Canvas, make sure you do that right now. It's on. It's on this current week, so week 12. And it's called um, Holy Drought Data. OK, let's go back here. OK, yeah. just making sure that I have the file in my current folder. <clears throat> Okay. 
Okay, so we're gonna first clear our memory. So clear, let's see, I'll see. Let's run this and save it. Okay, so what we're going to do is make this graph right here. So this is going to be around 50 lines of code. That's including spaces and comments and all that stuff. So it's not too long. So what we're doing is we're going to plot the amount of singles, doubles, triples, and home runs that Mike Trout had per year in his career so far. And of course, we're going to use looping to, to do a lot of this stuff here. Okay, so make sure again that you've downloaded the data. And then we're gonna start out with a lot of the kind of typical bookkeeping that we usually do. So that's clearing the memory and then actually importing the data, of course. Okay, so we're gonna do trout equals read table. Holy trout CSV. Okay, and then what I'm going to do here is um Convert uh, trout.player name to a string. So let's first run this right now. Okay, so if I type in class of trout.player name, then I'll tell us the type of data that we have for trout.player name. So the column player underscore name. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Ah, oh, didn't keep. Okay, class of trout.player name. It says it's a cell. So let's open up our table here. And okay, so column six, that's player name. So currently this is uh, stored as a cell array. Or actually a character array, really. So if I click on ANS, actually, okay, it's a cell array. So currently it's a cell array. So I, I can't access the, the name as a string. So what we're going to do is convert it to a string. So I'll do trout.player underscore name equals string of trout.player name. And then you'll see, if we go back to our table, now we're going to have uh, double quotes for a player name, which we do. So now I can reference uh, any row in here as a string. And we're going to use that later on for the for the plot title. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing we're going to do, we're going to find the unique years that Mike Trout played. Because we're, again, we're going to do this by year. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a date vector. So our function date vec, that's going to convert date time into a vector that's separated by the year, the month, the day, the hour, the minute, the second. So I'll show you what that looks like. So if we first go to our table right now, then we see we have game date. So currently this is date time. And we have the month, or sorry, the year, the month, and the day. So what I'm going to do is make this uh, variable here called date vec, date underscore vec. And I'm using the date vec function to, again, to separate the, the date time by the year, month, day, hour, minute, and second. So let's run that. And then we can look at date vec. And you see that it's separated, again, by the year. That's our first column. The month is the second column, and the third column is the date or the day, the day, the month. And we didn't have information on the hour, minute, or second, so they're just a zero. Okay, so I'm doing that just so I can reference the first column, which is going to be the year. And then I'm going to use the unique function that we learned the last time to find the unique years that Trout played. So do you find unique years? And we'll do years equals unique of the first column. So we're going to get all of the rows in the first column. <clears throat> OK, 
And then if I run that and I look at our variable years, then we have this 10 by 1 double. That shows every single year that he's played so far for, for the MLB. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to, again, go over some of this stuff somewhat faster so we can get to the looping part. Which um, we're starting on right now. So, um, you could, you know, actually make our plot here without using, um, without making tables. You could just reference the this kind of main table that we have here. But we're going to, just for sake of an example, we're going to imagine that we want to make a table for each year that Trout played. <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, we're actually going to get the indices for each unique year. So let's open up the table again. I want to get the indices for all of 2020. And then I want to get the indices for all of 2019 and 2018, uh, etc. Okay. So to do that, we have to find the indices. So here I'm going to use a for loop. So we'll first make a comment, gather specific data. Okay, and then here we're going to do 4j equals 1 to the length of years. Okay, so I'm doing this 1 to the length of years because I want to get the indices for each year. And I'm using j. You can use whatever you want again, but later on in our second line here, I'm going to make an array where j is going to correspond to the column. Okay, I'm going to make a comment inside of our for loop. So find indices for each unique year. And then here, I'm going to do unique underscore year underscore ind for indices. I'm using curly braces. I'll talk about that. And then I want to get all of the rows for the jth year. So um, I'm going to break this down actually quite a lot. So first I'll just type this out. And I'll define is member date vec. We're going to get all the rows in the first column. So the year, that's what we're looking at. And then I'm going to compare this with years of j. Okay. I'm going to run this. Yep. Forgot to end it. And you'll see here I have a red squiggly line because I didn't initialize my array here. Um, so I could have added more code for this part, but um, that would basically add more time for this example. So just for sake of time, I'm not going to do that right now. Okay, so let's look at our our uh, variable that we just created. So unique underscore year underscore ind. You see that right now, this is actually a cell array. So why did I do that? I'm going to break down quite a lot of this first. So let's see what I, the kind of, uh, the format that I did this in my slides. Okay. Okay, so the first thing, I'm just going to go by my slides because I was kind of thinking about how to, how to go about it. Sounds like too much work, are you saying, for the initializing, Osseo? <clears throat> hmm, yeah. Okay, so the first thing, we want to find the indices for each year. So because of that, we're going to loop through the length of years. The length of years, that was, what was it, 10? Yep. Yeah. So I want to loop through the length of this so I can get the indices for each specific year. And then we want to get all of the indices, of course, for each year. So to do that, I'm going to use array addressing. That's why I have this colon here. That's going to get all of the rows. And we have comma for the jth year. So if I go back to our table trout, I want to get all of the rows for each respective year. Now, why am I using curly braces for this array addressing? I'm using curly braces to um, make a cell. So 
Okay, yeah, let's actually just do this. Okay, so the length of each unique year, they might be different, which they are. If I go here, we see that all of these lengths are different. We have 534, this is 2000, or 2608, and then 3015. You get it. All of these are different. So they're different because for, you know, each year, um, trout is going to have a different amount of, uh, in quotes, events which is really just something that happens during an at-bat. So because they're all different, we need a way to handle that difference. So first off, if I instead had parentheses here and I ran our code, we're going to get an error. So it says unable to perform assignment because the size on the left-hand side is 534 by 1 and the size on the right-hand side is 2,608 by 1. So if we use array addressing like this, we're basically making a matrix here that has all of the rows for the jth year. But if we have a matrix in MATLAB, they, we need to have the same amount of rows for each column. And we don't have the same amount of rows for each column here because, um, like I just said, for each year, Trout was going to have just a different number of events, right? So if we go back here, and the year of 2020, Trout was going to have a lot less events than the year of 2019 because 2020 was shortened by coronavirus. Okay, so we need a way to deal with this. And if you're wondering why we have um, the left-hand side says 534 by 1 and the right-hand side is 2,608 by 1, let's go to, I'm going to change this here just to show you. So if we go here, um, our first uh, cell here that we're making is 534 by 1, and the second cell is 2,608 by 1. So if we have parentheses here, we, we went through our first loop. That was fine. So we got all of the values for the first year. But as we go through our second pass, um, all of the values for the second year, that's a different length. So that's when we, were, that's when we run into this issue. So to kind of skirt around this issue, really to solve it, we're going to use a cell. So to make a cell again, we're using curly braces here. And that's going to allow us to, to uh, store different vectors of different lengths. Okay, so here I can actually store um, all of the indices for each year in different cells. So a cell here is really just containing some unique vector. So before I continue on, um, are there any questions? I see I see that I missed one. Okay, Karen's getting an error of array indices must be positive integers or logical values. Um, I can't tell you why you have the error unless I actually saw your code. But you can stick around after class and we can go over it then. Okay, you got it. Okay. Okay, so does this make sense so far, though? We're, we're storing unique vectors in their own cell uh, because they're different lengths. Okay, I guess everyone gets it. Okay, so I can double-click on one of these cells, and that'll kind of expand here, and it'll show us um, all of the indices for for the first year in year, so that was uh, 2011. And likewise, I can open up the second one by double clicking on that, and that's going to open all of this up as well. And you'll see here at the very top, it shows unique year underscore ing and one comma two. So that's corresponding to the first row in our cell array here, and then the second column. What do those numbers represent? Then when you double click, oh, these numbers, yeah, uh, they reference the indices for that year in our first table here. So if I go to this one, unique underscore year underscore ind one comma one, that corresponds to the year two thousand eleven. So that's the indices for two thousand eleven that starts on row twenty two thousand nine hundred fifty six. We can double check that here. Really big spreadsheet. 
2,200, or 22,000 rather, 22,956. And then, yeah, we see that this corresponds to the first row when we're in the year 2011. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have all of them. And again, we can use array addressing just uh, by typing it out if we want to access one of those uh, vectors. So I could do unique underscore year underscore IND. And if I want to look at, let's say that, uh, year 2012 or 2013, I guess. I'll do 1, 3. And then we can get all of the indices for that year. Okay, so we have all of their indices now. Okay, I already talked about all of this here. So I made sure my slides were in depth. So if you're, if you want, if you want to kind of look at this a little slower like step by step you can do that as well okay so now we're going to make a table for each specific year so i'm still in my for loop here and i'll make another comment okay so i'm going to do make a table for each for each year so here I'm going to use the indices that we just found and I'm going to do unique here underscore table. And then in curly braces, I'm going to put J so we can reference the Jth year. And I'll do trial unique underscore year IND. So now we're accessing our main table, so to say. We're accessing this table that has all of our data. And then we're using array addressing where we're accessing the, the indices that we just found for each year. So we have trail unique underscore year IND. And then we're going to use array addressing for our cell array that we made. So in curly braces, all of the rows for the jth column in our cell array. And then we have, um, all of the columns for our main table for trail. So what we're doing here is we're getting, or we're making a table for each year, and we want to get all of the columns for each specific year, all of the rows and all of the columns for each specific year in our main table here. So that's quite a lot. I'll show you what this looks like. So if we run this, I should have put a semicolon there. Here we go. Okay, so this is the table that we just made. It's called Unique Year Table. So if I double click on the first one, this will be for 2011. And now you see that I have all of the data for the year 2011 for Mike Trout. And then I could do that for the next one. That'll be 2012. I have all of the data for 2012. Okay, so again, you might want to look at this line, you know, after class or something, if you're a little confused on it, but we're basically using array addressing for two different things. We're using array addressing for our big table that contains all of our data for a trout. And then we're using array addressing for the cell array that we had for our indices here. And we're using that to then make a table for each year. Okay, I'm really running out of time here. Wait, so professor, so basically we're making a table within a table? Um, no, we're making tables inside of a cell array. So okay. our cell array was unique year indices. And inside of our cell array, I'm going to use these indices to then get a table for each respective year. So here we have the indices, and now I'm kind of making a new cell array to have a table for each year. Okay. I don't think we're going to finish today. There's uh, too much to do here. So we'll probably pick up on it next time then. Um, so also I'll kind of 
talk about that a little more now since we basically have time. <laughs> so let's go over this part in a little more depth. I should have, um, well, I guess I can't talk about it here. So let's first just look at this right here. So this is a unique gear IND. So we're using array addressing here to look at our cell array here. So this is going to get all of the rows. I guess I actually didn't even really need this part here. But it's getting all of the rows. We only have one row. So it's going to get that. And then we're going to go for the jth column. So that'll be column 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 10. We want to get um, all of those indices. And we're going to use those indices for the main table that we have that's called trout. So within this cell, for the first one, we have all of the indices for the year 2011. So here, for this line of code right here, we're going in our main table called trout. And then we're going to use all of these indices for that main table. So we're going to go down to starting at row 22,956. Okay, so here we are, 22,956, that's the first row for the year 2011. <clears throat> so does that part make sense? We're using array yeah. addressing. Okay, you get it? I'll say it again for anyone else, though. We're using array addressing to go on our main table here for trout, and we're using the indices for the, each uh, jth year. So right now we're on the, the first year, which is 2011. Okay, and then at the very end here, I have a comma and then a colon. Because currently, just with what I have highlighted here, of course. Okay, so what I currently have highlighted here, that's just getting all of our rows here. But I want to get all of the columns as well. So I can have all of the data for each year. So that's why I have a comma and then a colon at the end. All right, so hopefully that makes a little more sense now. So I'll go over our next part here, but again, we don't have time to finish this, uh, unfortunately, today. So we'll finish it next time. That'll be next uh, Monday. So we're going to use for looping one more time, and that'll be for actually making our plots. Um, so you'll see that at the end here. I think we're doing, uh, yeah, we're actually doing uh, implicit looping again. Where was I? Yeah, right here. Okay. So now I want to find uh, specific things per year. So I'm going to find the amount of singles that Trout had per year. And then the amount of doubles, triples, and home runs. Actually, we'll pick up on this part next time. But if I make this bigger, then all we're going to do is we're going to use some of our techniques that we learned before. So we're using length. That'll give us the amount of singles in this case, the amount of singles per year. Find, that's going to give us the um, indices for this string compare, which will be single. So we'll go over this next time, but all this code here is going to give us the amount of singles per year, the amount of doubles per year, triples per year, and home runs per year. And so this is the full block of code that we're going to have. So yes, this is actually still part of our for loop here because we want to uh, iterate for the jth year. We're also iterating for the jth year over here. So we'll go over, again, we'll go over this next time. And then, yeah, and then we have uh, an implicit loop here because we have a table. Okay, so we'll do that next time. But uh, before we sign off here, don't forget your project is due this Wednesday by 11.59. If you have any questions, of course, go in the Discord or send me an email. But if you have a question, someone else probably does too. So it's, you know, I'd recommend going in the Discord. And no class this Wednesday. So I'm going to see all of you next Monday. But of course, your project is still due this Wednesday. 
All right, so that's that's all I got. So I'll see you guys next time. If you have any questions, you can stay or go to office hours today. Hey, Professor, have a good day. Thanks, you too. See you next week, Professor. See ya. Professor, for the, uh, the appendix, um, mm -hmm. how do you uh, do the, well, you, from your example, like with the dots and stuff on, on Word? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I haven't used Word in quite a long time, but there should be a way to do it too. You'll just have to Google that or look up a YouTube video. All right, any other questions? All right, Victor, anything?